for, uh, as you see, it, it is sort of three topics. So I'm going to try and step through these in the, in the following way. First, I'm going to talk about how HHT affects the GI tract um, or the digestive tract. And I'm going to then talk about specifically how to diagnose HHT related chronic bleeding from the GI tract. Next, I'll talk about the approach to treatment for GI bleeding and HHT. And then specifically, I'll introduce the concept of anti-angiogenic therapy. Once I've walked through that, I'll do, I'll do a very similar process for the liver. How does it affect um, people with HHT? How do we diagnose it? How do we treat it? And where does anti-angiogenic therapy fit in that, in that paradigm? And then I'm gonna end by talking about the the new therapies that are being um, developed and what are the next steps in, in the search and research of new therapies. So HHT GI bleeding or gastrointestinal bleeding is typically suspected when people with HHT have an unexplained anemia or iron deficiency, um, or it's out of keeping with their nosebleeds. It most typically affects the upper GI tract, which is really, which is made up of the stomach and the small bowels, and it less commonly affects the lower GI tract or the colon. There, it's typically a chronic and low-grade bleeding due to telangiectasia, not AVM, so small lesions in, in the lining or the mucosa of the stomach and small bowel. And these are some endoscopic pictures of telangiectasia, and these are in the range of a couple of millimeters in size, okay? Um, and patients who have chronic low-grade GI bleeding will often have multiple lesions like this throughout the stomach and, and small bowel. And, and these patients um, rarely have sudden or acute bleeding. It can happen, but it's a rare situation. And, and typically people who have this really don't have any symptoms at all, specifically of bleeding. Um, in fact, they don't even, they don't see blood in their stool, like red blood or digested black blood in the stool most of the time. Um, but rather it's picked up because we see, okay, this person is anemic and we don't have a good enough explanation why. And when that scenario happens in our HHT patients, our, our next step is to plan a diagnostic test. And that diagnostic test is typically going to be an upper GI endoscopy. So this actually, okay, this actually leads to our first, um, the first recommendation regarding GI bleeding in the HHT guidelines um, from the 2020 HHT guidelines that I want to talk about, that the expert panel clearly recommended that, and this is a, a, a big long name for basically a gastroscopy, what most people call a, a stomach scope or gastroscopy or a scope from above. Um, and, and, and we call it an EGD. Um, because it covers it when they put the camera in, they see the esophagus, um, the stomach or gas or gastric, um, and duodenoscopy, which is the first, the duodenum, which is the first part of the small bowel. So that is recommended as the first line diagnostic test for people with suspected HHT related bleeding. The guidelines panel also made a second recommendation regarding the diagnosis of HHT related GI bleeding, and that's when to consider what's called a capsule endoscopy. So the EGD or OGD that I just told you about is that is a scope, right, that's put in through the mouth to look down into the esophagus, stomach, and small bowel. So it's a long tube with a camera on it. Capsule endoscopy is, is a, a swallowed camera, so it's like a, a, a big pill that is actually a camera that you swallow and then it allows, and it takes photos all the way through the stomach and bowels as it's going through. So the expert panel recommended using capsule endoscopy when HHD related G GI bleeding is suspected, but that the first line test, the EGD, didn't really show much. So sometimes, and, and this is not an unusual scenario where sometimes we'll be saying we think that um, someone might have HHT related GI bleeding and they'll have a routine upper scope and, and the, and the res result will come back. Oh, there was nothing, there's nothing there. Um, and that, and, and the, the search shouldn't stop there. It should then be followed by a capsule endoscopy. So once we've done that initial diagnostic test, we next want to talk about how do we grade, how do we treat GI bleeding in HHT? And, and the HHT guidelines panel said, we need to decide about tre treatment for GI bleeding in HHT based on the severity of it. And, and though I showed you that we can see typical lesions um, on, this, on endoscopy, 
that help us diagnose HHT related bleeding, it turns out that the burden, like the number of lesions that we see um, on endoscopy is not a good indicator of the severity of HHT GI bleeding. Of course, there are, there are exceptions, some patients who have an extreme number of lesions or some that have very little that is quite clear to us that that's mild, you know, severe or mild in those contexts. But in general, the recommendation is that we should grade the severity of GI bleeding in HHT, not based on how many telangiectasia there are in endoscopy, but rather based on the, um, the complications of GI bleeding in HHT, which are the anemia and, uh, and iron deficiency and what support a person needs in terms of iron replacement or blood transfusions, that those are the things that tell us whether GI bleeding is mild, moderate, or severe. And this is a, a new sort of framework that the HHT guidelines uh, panel put forward um, and recommended that clinicians use to grade the severity of HHT related bleeding, HHT related GI bleeding. So a patient with mild disease is one that meets their hemoglobin goals. Um, and, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute, but basically their, their blood work or their anemia is well controlled with oral iron replacement. Someone with moderate may be also having a good result, but they need intravenous iron to get there to maintain it. And someone with severe disease is someone that despite our best efforts with iron replacement and maybe even blood transfusions, um, they still are anemic um, and we don't have good control of their blood work. So hemoglobin goals, this term was used because the, the um, cutoffs for what's considered a normal hemoglobin vary from country to country and kit and assay to assay, but also um, it, it does depend um, on someone's age and their um, symptoms and their other disease. So this, these are individualized targets, okay? But this is how we're recommending grading the severity of GI bleeding. So this gives us now a framework for saying, how do we treat people with GI bleeding? So first, as I mentioned, we make the diagnosis with endoscopy. Second, as you saw that all three types of severity involved iron replacement. So we need to manage the iron deficiency and anemia in the range, and, and, and um, this ranges from oral iron to intravenous iron to blood transfusions. And usually the first step in terms of treatment is actually treating the lesions at the time of the diagnostic endoscopy. So while they're in there looking and seeing that you have, and this is a, if it's done through a scope, um, that, and they see the telangiectasia, they can, the gastroenterologist can, can burn those with um, a tool. Usually it's called, usually it's APC that they use or argon photocoagulation. Um, and that can be a reasonable thing to do on the first, on the first scope. But at the international HHT guidelines uh, process that the, you know, after reviewing the evidence and discussing this amongst the experts, the expert panel recommended that that type of endoscopic treatment be used really sparingly or basically at initial diagnosis or a limited number of times. There's been some, you know, historically there have been um, approaches where people have just consistently treated endoscopically. Like I have you know, some patients who've come to me over the years who said, oh yes, every six months I go to my gastroenterologist and he just burns everything he could see. And I've been doing that for 10 years. So the, the, the evidence doesn't, you know, when we look back on that now in current day, we can say the evidence doesn't really support that as a highly effective approach. And we think there are better approaches. Um, and so that's why the guidelines um, team, panel recommended just using it sparingly or initially or a small number of times. However, the panel had other recommendations to make for treatment about people, for, for people with HHT related GI bleeding. And the panel recommended that clinicians use in, my, in patients with mild bleeding, um, oral antifibrinolytics. And I'm gonna talk about those in more detail in a minute. And that in moderate to severe bleeding, that, that treatment with systemic anti-angiogenic anti therapy be considered. And I'm gonna talk about that in more detail in a moment too. So all of this is sort of predicated as well as um, just coming back to the, 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 the grading of anemia. It's not meant to be a grading that you would, that you would, you would um, um, determine based on the first time you see somebody or the first blood work they have. The idea is that you're treating them and you've been, say you've had several months of having them on iron therapy 
oral or IV, et cetera, and you're seeing what they're, you know, where you can get them to on appropriate therapy. So now coming back to the antifibrinolytics. So what are antifibrinolytics? It's a type of medication that's used to stabilize blood clots. And as you know, when you bleed, the way that you stop bleeding is that your body forms a blood clot. So blood clots are important um, to control HHT related bleeding and to limit how, how long and how severe the bleeding is. So these are medications that were actually designed for people with blood clotting disorders, but have turned out to be interesting and low risk um, and, and helpful in HHT patients. Um, and and the, the one that's currently available and most typically used is called uh, tranexamic acid or cyclocapron. And there's quite a bit of experience using this. I mean, we've been using this in patients in the Toronto HHT Center for more than 20 years um, for, uh, the, though we have not used it always um, as early in the management of GI bleeding as the guidelines are currently recommending. So the, there is a little bit of evidence for tranexamic acid in GI bleeding, though not very much. Um, most of the evidence for tranexamic acid in HHT related bleeding is from nosebleed studies. And, and this is something we'll see across the board in, in HHT related bleeding clinical trials is that they will be primarily um, designed to, to, um, to show effectiveness at, at improving nosebleeds because that's it something that's more feasible for us to measure and also you know because patients can report their nosebleeds whereas it's hard to report what's happening with the GI bleeding um, but also it's a very common symptom in, in HHT of course that we're wanting to find effective therapies for but we think that if tranexamic acid if a pill or an injection that that's you know reaching all parts of the body if it works well on the nose on the, the bleeding from the, the telangiectasia and the mucosa of the nose, then we suspect that it's going to work well in the, the bleeding from the telangiectasia and the mucosa of the GI tract. And, and clinically that has been the case that typically um, systemic or meaning drugs that you give um, that, that go everywhere in the body that work on nosebleeds tend to work on GI bleeding. So the evidence for tranexamic acid comes from some two randomized controlled trials of, where they measured nosebleeds um, in 135 and 22 patients, and they showed that it improved nosebleeds and anemia. And then a very small series, a, re a retrospective series, where um, 10 patients with GI bleeding had a significant clinical improvement um, um, need, with less need for, uh, for medical and endoscopic interventions when they were on oral tranexamic acid. So this is this is um, most of the, this is the evidence base for the recommendation that the guidelines, as well as the incredible, uh, as well as the expert experience of all of the clinicians involved. As I mentioned, this is a drug that we've been using a long time in HHT patients. So what about anti-angiogenic therapy? What does that mean? And why is that, why are we, why are we excited about that in HHT? Well, um, AVMs and HHT, we know, and, and Dr. Krings uh, um, started the discussion about this yesterday when he showed some, a few slides describing the, the imbalance in blood vessel development in HHT. So AVMs, we think that they form in HHT due to an imbalance in angiogenesis. Angiogenesis is the term for blood vessel development and growth. And we think that, um, you know, as I mentioned to you very uh, yesterday in the overview talk, People with HHT have lots of normal blood vessels, um, but they have some that have turned into malformations. And we think that um, probably that one of the mechanisms for that to happen, for an AV, you know, a normal blood vessel to turn into an AVM or for an AVM to form in one place, whereas you know, so, right beside it, there's a normal blood vessel, is that probably there was an injury at that place where the AVM forms. And then when the blood, when the body is trying to, to repair the blood vessels from that injury, there's this imbalance in, in the blood vessel development in the angiogenesis. It's like a dysfunctional repair system and the AVM forms, okay? So AVMs form due to an imbalance in angiogenesis. And the other thing we've learned in recent years is that there really are a number of molecular pathways involved in this process. And that makes it complicated, but it also makes it kind of interesting because there are a lot of pathways that we could target to try and treat HHT. Um, 
And there are new medications being developed which can help control these pathways. And some of them have been developed for other diseases, but we're repurposing them for HHT. And some of them are being developed specifically for HHT with the idea of trying to correct this imbalance. So the first type of medication uh, or the first medication really that, that came out um, of this type uh, of the anti-angiogenic type um, that was of interest for HHT targeted a molecule called VEGF, which is part of some of these pathways uh, involved in angiogenesis. And so we call this anti-VEGF therapy. And specifically anti, the anti-VEGF treatment that we have available presently and that we have the most experience with is bevacizumab, also known as Avastin. And I'm gonna talk specifically a little bit more about that in a second. But first I just wanna show you how uh, uh, some evidence from a mouse model, from Paul O's mouse model um, that they published, their team published in 2014, just to give you a bit of an idea uh, of, of how, you know, some of the initial um, animal evidence uh, showed effectiveness of anti-VEGF therapy for NHHT. So when we want to study a new and we want to bring a new drug to people with a disease, we want to first study it in animals. And so we have to first have animal models of that disease. And Paulo has created a, 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 um, one of the very, um, 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 one of the very um, useful um, and much used models um, for HHT in a mouse. So Paulo has a mouse model. The mouse has HHT basically, and he has a, he creates a window into the, the skin of the mouse and he creates an injury in the skin of the mouse. So you heard that I said before that we think that AVMs form as a response to injury. So this is, this is why he, he created this whole um, laboratory system for seeing whether we could form AVMs. So here's the, here's the injury, okay, in the mouse, in this, in this window into the mouse's skin and the mouse has HHT. And if you um, if you once once they create this injury, and these are these are just kind of two views of the same panel, over the coming days, the mouse recovers by creating an AVM. That's what these big blood vessels are, are in the area of the injury. But if you treat the patient with an and uh, the patient, I'm sorry, the mouse with an anti-VEGF therapy before creating the injury. So that's what this panel is here. Then you can prevent, Paulo has shown that he can prevent that AVM from forming. These are just smaller vessels forming around the area of injury, but no AVM forming over the injury. So I think you can see just even just visually um, here that anti-VEGF therapy can influence how uh, an HHT mouse anyway can respond to an injury and, if, and prevent it forming an AVM. So this and some clinical case reports were the very first observations that led the, you know, the HHT medical community to say, well, we should be thinking about this as a treatment for HHT patients. And in fact, um, if we look at um, a recent um, series of 34 HHT patients with chronic severe bleeding, um, nasal and GI bleeding, uh, who were treated with intravenous bevacizumab, 80% of them had a, had a response to therapy. And, with, and this was with a significant reduction in blood transfusion requirements. So these were not people with mild disease. They were people with severe HHT-related GI bleeding who had already stepped through all of the other approaches that we've talked about and who were treated with intravenous bevacizumab and had an excellent response and no longer needed regular blood transfusions, for example, or saw a significant reduction. So this was, our, this, um, this was um, published by Vivek Iyer um, and around the same time, a lot of the HHT center directors were coming together and sharing their experience about using bevacizumab, which started about 10 years ago. And now, now there are hundreds of patients that have been treated with bevacizumab um, and across HHT centers with very similar responses and several other series that have been published reflecting that. So um, before we move on to liver, I just, you know, just want to mention that this is, I, I just want to underline again that what we're talking about with bevacizumab is not a first line treatment for everyone's, uh, everyone who has nosebleeds or HHT related GI bleeding. It's a treatment for severe disease. Um, and I'm giving you the, um, the highlights of what we know about 
when we should use it and what kind and how it might be effective. But it's quite a specialized therapy and has its has its risks as well, um, which I'm happy to discuss further um, in the question period. I, I'm I'm not going to do that right now. Um, given that we've got a lot to cover in this in this talk um, and I want to make sure to cover the liver piece. But I do think that, um, and so I want to underline the fact that this type of therapy should be given in an expert HHT center or with guidance from an expert HHT center um, given, um, given um, you know, its risks and benefits, okay? So let's talk about the liver now. So as I mentioned yesterday, liver VMs are actually not liver AVMs. They're not large AVMs, they're telangiectasia and sometimes in clusters. And we call that vas liver vascular malformation. So we don't use the term liver AVMs clinically. And in fact, sometimes it's a misnomer that uh, confuses other clinicians that don't see this as often because they think, oh, if you just did an ultrasound, you'd see if there's a big AVM in the liver, but that, that's not what we actually see in HHT. It's not what we look for. They're telangiectasia. And then it's the number of telangiectasia that someone has in their liver that determines whether it's, it's mild, moderate, or severe. So how do we, um, you know, what do liver vascular malformations look like? They don't look like these lung AVMs that I showed you yesterday, which are, these are, you know, the, the, this lesion here, for example, is a couple of centimeters in size, okay? They're not big like that. They're little tiny, these little tiny fluffy bits at the end of the blood vessels on this angiogram of the liver. That, those are the kinds of lesions we see in, in, in HHT liver disease. And this is another uh, contrast enhanced cross-sectional image of the liver, again, where we see ves blood, the blood vessels of the liver with little fluffy uh, patches at the end. And all of this is abnormal. The ends of the blood vessels should look like they look over here in the lung, like a, a tree that's getting with branches that are getting smaller and smaller, but all of these tufts at the end, those are telangiectasias and clusters of telangiectasia. So that's the kind of thing, uh, the kind of disease that we're talking about when we're talking about liver vascular malformations in HHT. So about 75% of people with HHT have liver vascular malformations. And we know this from, re from research studies where they did um, you know, CT scans with dye in multiple phases and looked very hard for even and with very advanced technology for even the tiniest telangiectasia. So if you count even people that have three or four or five telangiectasia in the liver, then you end up saying that 75% of people with HHT have this, but there really is a range or a continuum of severity. And most people have a small number of telangiectasias and don't ever have symptoms from them. But there is a 10% of people with HHT that have many, many telangiectasias in the liver and that they, de they develop clinical complications or symptoms from those. And those are the, those are the patients that, where we recommend treatment. We don't recommend putting the other people who are asymptomatic and have only a small number of telangiectasia on any kind of treatment that might just do them more harm than good. Okay, so um, in, in terms of screening testing, their screening for liver vascular malformations, we routinely recommend screening HHT for patients for liver vascular malformations, but this can be done um, in a clinically non-invasive way. So we, want, we don't want to use um, tests that have risks if we think that somebody has uh, an asymptomatic liver vascular malformations that we're not planning to treat. So instead we try to use our clinical skills to assess them, whether they have symptoms, we examine them for a brewery, we do blood work for liver function tests, um, we look at their heart function to make sure they don't have any signs of heart failure. If all of that is negative, um, Sometimes we might also do a specialized ultrasound or we might be happy enough that we've not detected any significant liver vascular malformations even from the clinical assessment. So we do, you know, there's a range of how we can do that clinically. When we do suspect liver vascular malformations though, and we think someone might be having symptoms or complications of it, then we'll want to confirm that test, uh, that initial screening with either a contrast CT scan or a contrast MRI. So what's the approach to treatment of liver vascular malformations? As I, as I want to emphasize one more time, 90% of people with liver vascular malformations don't need treatment. But there are 10% who have complications or symptoms, and, and, and those can be quite serious and definitely do need treatment. And 
the, the first line treatment for people with liver vascular malformations is to treat those complications or symptoms. And, uh, and, and it depends on the type of presentation. So there's sort of diff some very different ways that someone with liver vascular malformations can present, um, can, can have symptoms. Um, the most common is having symptoms of high output heart failure. So retaining fluid in the legs, in the lungs, um, feeling tired and weak. Um, sometimes complicated by pulmonary hypertension. Less frequently, we see fluid in the belly, for example, due to what's called portal hypertension. So it's um, the liver's uh, sort of fluid backing up from the liver. And even less frequently, but also important, some people will have bile duct disease, which is where they have a chronic severe pain over the liver um, and inflammation and, and sometimes infection of the bile ducts. So these can be quite serious presentations. Each one is treated as they would be outside of HHT, these, these very same types of complications that the treatment is quite similar, but, but, you know, but, but um, can be, um, particularly with the heart failure and, 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 and if there's secondary pulmonary hypertension, often really does require an expert team for management. So after that first line treatment, if people do well and we stabilize the heart failure, which for example, we're able to do in, in uh, the majority of patients, then we, keep, we continue on therapy and we monitor. Um, if symptoms, however, persist or worsen, that's when we're gonna be thinking about anti-angiogenic therapy, sorry for the typo there, uh, and or liver transplantation. And a few years ago, we didn't have this anti-angiogenic therapy line. We just had liver transplantation as the option if, if we didn't see improvement with the first line therapy. So this has really changed the face of liver vascular malformations care in the last few years. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that information. So just to come back to the specific recommendations for liver vascular malformations treatments from the guidelines, um, the guideline panel recommended intensive first line management for patients with complicated or symptomatic liver vascular malformations tailored to the type of complication, so as, I, as I was just detailing. And that the guidelines panel also wanted to make sure that patients who have these types of complications, high output heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, that they be managed by an HHT center of excellence and a cardiologist or a pulmonary hypertension clinic, given the complexity in the management here. Secondly, um, as I mentioned in the, in, you know, in patients that don't respond to first line therapy, the expert panel did recommend intravenous bevacizumab or liver transplantation um, be considered in these cases. And the intravenous bevacizumab, uh, I'm going to show you uh, this, what the studies are on this, but it really has been studied and shown to be, and mostly shown to be effective in patients who have high output heart failure from liver vascular malformations rather than the necessarily the other complications. Um, and so the, that the recommendation here for intravenous bevacizumab or systemic bevacizumab was for that group if they didn't respond to first line management. Whereas um, patients with other with, with high output heart failure, but also the other types of complications from liver vascular malformations are more typically recommended for referral, uh, recommended for consideration for liver transplantation if they don't respond to first line therapy. So what's the evidence for bevacizumab um, in liver vascular malformations? Um, this is, uh, the, you know, this is the first study was Sophie Dupuy-Gerod study from the Lyon HHT Center. And sorry, the, the, the year went off the page there. I think it was from 2012. Um, and they, they, they studied 25 patients prospectively with severe liver vascular malformations and high output failure, and 90% of them responded um, to the bevacizumab, though 10% did eventually need a liver transplant. Since that time, there have been a couple of other series of similar size um, uh, showing similar results. So, uh, you, know, tip, you know, all of the studies typically agree that there's a very high response with improvement in symptoms, though there is a certain percentage of patients that, that recur and that do end up needing, do end up getting referred for liver transplantation. So um, if I'm just gonna, I'm gonna switch gears now um, and talk about a little bit more about other therapies other than bevacizumab. So I told you that there are a lot of therapies in development um, uh, and, and that bevacizumab is sort of the first of these anti-angiogenic therapies that we are, um, that, that was described in HHT and that we're clinically using in HHT. And you've seen that it's, it's recommended in the guidelines as well. But you also see that in the guidelines, for example, 
there's um, they say the, the recommendation for intravenous bevacizumab, actually this was on the GI one, is for intravenous bevacizumab or um, other anti-angiogenic medications. And that's because there are other anti-angiogenic medications that are sort of in the pipeline um, or um, uh, and being uh, either developed or studied. And I just wanted to, to show you the long list of novel therapies that are of interest presently. And I've probably, I'm probably missing some of them, um, but this is actually just a casual list that was put together at the end of one of, one of our scientific conferences. And we said, you know, in this HHT scientific conference, what type of new therapies did we talk about? And this was the list. I mean, it, you know, it was a dramatic change from 10 years earlier when we had, um, you know, two or three things on the list. So bevacizumab, I've talked to you about, there are a number of other pathway uh, inhibitors that are uh, of interest. There's some, there's some things in the list here that are not necessarily anti-angiogenic, though they may have anti-angiogenic properties like vitamin D, for example, um, um, and beta blockers um, that are also of interest uh, of tr as treatment uh, in HHT. And what I've done is I've put little asterisks beside the ones that are that where we have clinical trials either in progress or um, planned or recently completed. So there, there is um, a lot going on, a lot, um, a lot to be optimistic about in terms of anti-angiogenic and other novel therapies for HHT. And I think those are gonna be specifically most important in these patients initially, the patients with severe liver vascular malformations and patients who have chronic, who have moderate to severe chronic HHT related GI bleeding. It may be that eventually these therapies will, will could be extended to milder bleeding, um, you know, and the range of nose bleeding, for example, or to other organs like management of brain AVMs, the ones that can't be treated or that aren't uh, ideally treated with uh, surgery or embolization, maybe we'll be treating those with anti-angiogenic therapy down the road. I think there's, you know, all of these things are, are being considered and are on our potential, are part of the potential. Presently though, we are in a position of needing a lot more research to understand the effectiveness and safety of each of the novel therapies um, and, and, and also developing more novel therapies, but also figuring out as we do our research, who is going to best respond. So it may be that there will be certain um, genotypes or certain age groups or certain HHT um, types or um, uh, you know, other medical comorbidities that may determine how somebody responds to a given medication for HHT. So in order to understand that and be able to sort of personalize our approach to, to, um, to HHT treatment, we, we really need a large number of patients. Um, we need a large number of patients in a, in a large registry, a longitudinal registry, and, and that has been started, has been launched in our HHT registry, which uh, we now have several centers who are part of and recruiting for. Um, we also need, of course, clinical trials, um, and we need more basic research to help us understand and develop more new therapies. So I'm going to I'm going to end there, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Farnham, for a very informative talk. I'm sure the attendees were very interested in hearing of the wide variety of therapies that are currently available and all the prospective therapies is very optimistic. Um, we have a few questions. Okay. So the first question is, does having HHT affect the way a female may have a menstrual cycle regarding to flow and anemia? So that's a good question. Um, and maybe Dr. Lausman will, will comment too when she's um, speaking later. Um, but we don't really know how HHT affects menstrual bleeding. It makes sense that there are probably, um, there are probably some people, some women with HHT that have worse menstrual bleeding because of HHT lesions um, in the, um, in the uterus, but we don't actually have any good data to help support that or to help us sort out what's normal, you know, what, what's similar to the general population and what's really HHT related. Um, 
there, um, there was a second part to your question too. I'm sorry. Oh, right, anemia. So one thing we do know though, is that <clears throat> it's a hard combination for a lot of uh, young women if they have nosebleeds and heavy menstrual bleeding, whether that menstrual bleeding is related to their HHT or not, it can certainly contribute to their iron deficiency and anemia. And we do know that that, that often is the case, particularly for, for, uh, for younger women. Thank you. Uh, and another question is, someone asks, how do I sign up for a study? And I believe they're referring to uh, participating maybe in clinical studies or other types of basic research studies. Yeah, great question. So um, usually each, each um, study is under an investigator and that investigator um, sets up their study at their institution, even if it's a multi, and, and it might be a single center study or a multi-center study. Um, but the, and that investigator or, or PI, as we call them, uh, principal investigator will set up and get the ethics approval and the consent forms, et cetera, set up at, at their institution. And if it's a single set center study, then the way to join that study is to call that institution and say, you know, I'd like to be part of your study and they'll be able to tell you what your what their requirements are, what the eligibility criteria are for the study. Um, if it's a multi-center study, then that PI who's, you know, who's leading that study will help set up all the other centers across um, the country or, the, or internationally at, um, with the same process. Um, and, so, and so then you could reach out to the site that's closest to you to ask whether you could be involved in that study. Um, anything that's a clinical trial is on the, um, you know, so how do you find out about studies? I guess a couple of ways. Um, one is uh, Cure HHD does, it, um, uh, does distribute a lot of information about ongoing clinical trials. So that's the International HHT Foundation. I'm quite sure if you reach out to HHT Canada, they would also be able to help you um, identify if there are any clinical trials, for example, or whether you could be part of the HHT registry uh, that I mentioned, they could point you in the right direction for doing this. Um, in addition, anything that's a clinical trial is listed on the clinicaltrials.gov website. So you can go and search there under HHT and find what's going on and see what the contact process is for each trial. Hope Thank that you. helps. Okay. Very good response. Uh, is a liver ultrasound Doppler the same as a fibro scan? No. <laughs> that's an easy one, sort of. Um, it's easy because it's not the same thing. It's hard because I don't know a lot about fibro scans, um, that, but they're used, uh, it's quite a different technology that's used to as assess certain kinds of liver disease. Um, and the, the liver ultrasound Doppler is much more just like a regular liver ultrasound. It seems like that when you're a patient undergoing it. Um, but the, the uh, Doppler piece is that in addition to ultrasounding over the liver, the technologist actually uses uh, a, a technology that allows to measure blood flow. So they're looking at the structures of the liver with ultrasound, but also looking at blood flow through the, through the, um, uh, at, at the same time. And we have a very um, specific protocol that we've established in some of our HHT centers um, to specifically use that technology to look for liver vascular malformation. So it's not something you can get at an outside um, an outside lab or that most hospitals that are not, that don't have an HHT center would, would specifically do for, um, in the way that we need it to detect liver vascular malformations. It's a specialized study done at an HHT center. Thank you very much. Uh, another question, could radioembolization, for example, Y90 treatment, be applied to liver vascular malformations or excessive GI bleeding? So um, I'm gonna talk about embolization in general for liver vascular malformations and GI bleeding rather than, this, rather than specific subtypes of that um, because that's a good question and it's something that I didn't talk about today. The main reason I didn't talk about it is because we don't recommend it for liver vascular malformation. So there is quite an experience in using embolization for liver vascular malformations with a number of different techniques, different technologies, you know, um, different processes like um, aggressive or not aggressive or peripheral, you know, peripheral or, low, uh, or central. And, and all of those have quite a high risk of complications, even though they sometimes might 
help. So sometimes, you know, like 20 years ago, when people were embolizing liver vascular malformations, because it was sort of that or do liver transplant, sometimes people did do that treatment. And sometimes it worked, sometimes it helped with people's heart, with a patient's heart failure, but there was a 25% risk of death with the procedure. And that it's not the procedure, like not at the time of the procedure, but it's that when you block off blood vessels to the liver and someone with liver vascular malformations, it can cause the liver to suffer and become necrotic. So that's what, that's what people died from in the days or weeks after embolization. So in general, the embolization is recommended, we recommend against embolization of liver vascular malformations. As with anything, there are exceptions. So there are situations where we might still consider an embolization, but it's really, um, the, it's really a, a rare exception. For the GI tract, um, we typically don't embolize given um, that the, the lesions are mucosal and tiny. Um, so they are better accessed through the scope um, if we're trying to treat them in, with an interventional approach. But sometimes people have a larger lesion in AVM. And so we access it through the blood vessels and we embolize it. So we do sometimes do that. It's just, it's a rare subset, like maybe about 1% of the GI bleeders um, who would, um, or, you know, one or something in that range who would benefit from an embolization. Thank you. Uh, so what is the relationship between HHT and anticoagulants or blood thinners? Is there additional risk in taking these types of medications? So, um, you know, we talked about this yesterday, but really good to talk about it again. Um, so the reason that we talk about anticoagulations, um, anticoagulation in HHT and in the HHT guidelines is not because it's a treatment for HHT, but because sometimes our HHT patients have other medical problems where they end up needing an anticoagulant. You know, they have arrhythmias, um, or they have a heart, heart disease, or they have had blood, unwanted blood clots in the legs or lungs, and they need to be on an anticoagulant or a blood thinner. And, and you know, we, though often those things can be quite serious diseases and complications, and we don't want, we don't want to bar people's access to blood anticoagulation because it might be life-saving. So the approach that we typically take is we say, people with HHT who need an anticoagulant for another reason urgently should have that. Okay, and in the vast majority of cases, we should not block that. It's not an absolute contraindication, but that we may need, we, we may expect to see worse bleeding. So if they have nasal and GI bleeding, it'll probably be worse on the blood thinner and they'll probably need to step, we'll probably need to step up their therapy, maybe from oral iron to IV iron or IV iron to blood transfusions. So it, it is something that we have to do with our eyes wide open, but but typically we'll say, yes, start that anticoagulation now at 2 a.m. on Friday night. And you know, over the coming weeks, we're gonna be adjusting their supportive therapy as depending on how much this makes their bleeding worse. Um, it's rare that anticoagulation will cause sudden life-threatening bleeding in HHT patients. It's mostly that it makes chronic bleeding worse. Um, but to avoid that sudden life-threatening bleeding, we always wanna make sure that people on anticoagulation have been checked and treated for lung AVMs, brain AVMs, et cetera. So, so that's kind of our typical approach. Thank you. Uh, we have time for maybe a few more questions. Sure. Uh, one, one particular question, are colonoscopies used at all in the, the management of HHT? Great question. So, um, you know, uh, we're trying to focus on the common things. I didn't really talk about that in the presentation today, but it's a really good question. So first of all, most people with most bleeding in HHT happens from the upper GI tract, not from the colon, but there are exceptions. Every rule has its exception, right? And, and there are people that do have some telangic tasia from HHT in the colon, and that will be, that will need a colonoscopy to diagnose that and, and potentially treat it, like do that first line treatment endoscopically. Um, most importantly though, I think the role of colonoscopy in HHT is, is a little bit different. Um, the most important and the most frequent thing I talk about with my patients is that just because you have HHT doesn't mean that, that we should forget to screen you for colon cancer the way everybody else needs screening for colon cancer. So, and let me explain what I mean is that, you know, in someone that doesn't have HHT, let's take a 55 year old man who does not have HHT, if he goes to the doctor and he has a low ferritin and he's iron deficient, every doctor in the world will say, you need a colonoscopy in case this is, in case you've got a, a colon cancer. 
an early colon cancer that we could pick up that's causing this bleeding um, and, and we could treat that and cure it. So that would be every doctor's response. But in, if that 55 year old man with an iron deficiency has HHT, many people and doctors and patients will think, well, this is because of the HHT and they won't proceed, they won't push for that colonoscopy. So one of the, you know, certainly one of the things I've talked to patients about, I, I try to talk to patients about a lot um, and that we talked about in the guidelines and referred to in the guidelines too, is that people with HHT should have screening colonoscopies just like anybody else does to screen for colon cancer so that we don't miss that opportunity to catch an early colon cancer and treat it. And then there's one other area where colonoscopies are relevant in HHT. Um, and that's in um, the, the small percentage of HHT patients that have SMAD4 mutation. I talked about this yesterday, very briefly though, that 3% of HHT families have a mutation in a gene called SMAD4. And those people actually have two diseases, mostly. Most often they have two diseases. They have HHT and they have juvenile polyposis. And juvenile polyposis is a disease that causes polyps in the colon and the and the stomach too, and can lead to early colon cancer. So those people need to be looked after by a polyposis expert and have routine screening with, of the stomach and the colon according to their juvenile polyposis recommendations.